Welcome, everyone. Today, I would love for you, um, this is just a giant welcome for everybody that's on the phone, as well as those of you who are listening to the recording. This is just a little bit of an overview about us. My name is Donna Brighton, and today I'm joined by Scott Belke. Before we get started, there's something really important that we need you to know. We want to remind you that you have incredible brilliance and everyone around you is blessed when you share your brilliance. So as a part of the webinar today, we would love for you to chime in on the chat box. Make sure that your comments are addressed to all participants, which enables the awesome and amazing people that have joined us today to benefit from your brilliance. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Les, for sharing. Um, and we're excited to have you all be part of this call today. Our goal today is simple. We want to focus on change leadership. Now, this is different than change management, which according to the Association of Change Management Professionals, is the practice of applying a structured approach to transition an organization from a current state to a future state to achieve expected benefits. Change leadership, on the other hand, is a capability, an ongoing practice of leaders. It's interesting because if you think about it, change is a core component of leadership. Leaders define a vision and then align people to it and inspire them to make it happen. If you're not changing, then are you really leading? That is really the focus of our time today. Specifically, our agenda has three key topics. We're going to talk about roadblocks, what gets in the way of successful change. Then we're going to highlight a specific focus that's super important in great change leadership, and that is effective communication. Finally, we're going to share with you the change leader toolkit that will help you as a leader or help you coach leaders to increase their effectiveness at multiple changes. So I'd love to hear from you. What gets in the, in the way of successful change? So Bruce shared new team members versus legacy team members. And there's a lot of common roadblocks that we can commiserate on in successful change. Possibly things like lack of resources or maybe a misunderstanding of change management. So it gets watered down to just communication and training. Some other roadblocks might include resistance, or a change in sponsor. For our time today, we're gonna to focus on these four roadblocks. These are essential to understand and be able to brief a sponsor or a leader about so he or she can better understand what may prevent successful change. So let's tackle that first roadblock, capacity. Believe it or not, change capacity is a limited resource. One of the fabulous contributions Daryl Connor made to the discipline of change is the concept of human due diligence. Just as you would do technical due diligence and financial due diligence, human due diligence is essential to successful projects. So let's unpack that a little bit. When I'm talking about due diligence, I mean conducting a comprehensive appraisal to ensure that a leader has sufficient information to exercise care before initiating a change. The technical and financial components are pretty simple. Do you have the technology or tools needed to make the change and the financial resources to make the change? The human part is a little more complicated. Many changes today require some level of human acceptance or adoption in order to be successful. There's a big difference between implementing the change doing a reorganization, putting in a new performance management system, or moving to a remote working space, and realizing the benefits of the changes that were made. When people buy into or adopt the change, you realize the benefits. When they don't, technically, change fails. The idea here is to understand that each person has a capacity for change. And that's represented by the fun glasses on the screen. It's taken up both by personal and professional changes. 
So one of the fun things I like to do whenever I'm sharing this concept on stage is actually holding a glass in my hand and I have a pitcher of water that I start pouring into the glass. And I talk about the fact that everything that's going on in your life can take up some of that change capacity. So you might have a child that is coming home for the summer and so that's making some change in your life or a sick parent or you're deciding to train for a marathon or you're getting a new boss at work. So whatever those changes are that are impacting you, it's taking up some of your capacity. And when it runs out, the most dedicated employee can become dysfunctional. So essentially what happens as you start piling on all these changes is you run out of capacity. The space in the glass is exceeded and that water overflows and change is no longer effective. So the lesson for leaders is that they have to understand the pace of change that their organization can handle based on capacity. The next roadblock. This one has to do with capability. So when you think about it, um, and a change target, again, is just the official kind of language in the change management vernacular. So these are the people being impacted by the change. Um, so the question is, do they have the ability needed to make the change? <clears throat> and how I'd like to illustrate this is a concept that comes from Switch. So many of you are probably familiar with this outstanding book. And Dan and Chip use the old story of the rider, the elephant, and the path to explain the various components in change. And I love this illustration, especially when it comes to capability, because you need all three. So directing the rider, the rider is really about the head, right? So do you have the knowledge? Do you have um, kind of the, the, the insight? So if it's a new system, have you learned how to use it? Then there's the motivation part, which is the desire or willingness to make the change. But something that's often overlooked is the path. And that's about um, sort of the, the organizational elements, the things that are, that are going on around that particular change that either make it more or less difficult. And so many times I've observed changes where leaders are sharing the new change, people are learning, they're re receiving training, and then they don't remove the roadblocks. So the path is littered with um, obstacles and frustrations that prevent people from making the change. So capability is a really critical thing to pay attention to as you're working to figure out how to make change. Now the next roadblock I'd like to talk about is culture. Remember, beliefs drive behavior. And collective behavior is what leads to results or outcomes. So if you think of that at an individual level and then an organizational level, the organizational level is where the culture comes into play. Now during change, usually new behaviors are required. We use things like training and communication to help people understand and learn new behaviors. However, if there are underlying beliefs that support the old behavior, then no amount of training or communication will create lasting change. So if belief drives behavior, are you paying attention to the beliefs that are contrary to the change you're trying to make? Well, a key way that you can um, deal with that is through culturally intelligent change. We actually have a checklist and an ebook that's available to help you better understand where in the change process various culture actions should be incorporated. Because as much as people may want to make the change and you inspire them, if there are beliefs um, that underlying culture holds people back or prevents them from making the change, and again, that will serve as a roadblock to successful change. So it's absolutely essential that you're paying attention to culture, measuring it, and recognizing the beliefs, those underlying beliefs driving behavior, and where they're helping or hindering the change that you want to make. Donna, a good example of that? Yes. Be, we were working with an organization where they were trying to centralize customer service 
away from 28 regional decentralized offices. They had a great communication and change program, but the people in the offices had a long held belief that it was their responsibility and their job to provide customer service for every single thing that came in to their office. They also believed and was reinforced that any time customer service from the pre-change would handle something, it wouldn't get done in the right way. So we needed to address that belief system before we had started changing processes and the way things were done. Absolutely. That's a great example. Thanks, Scott. And very true. And we know it was interesting, and I remember that um, very vividly. Um, the change team immediately um, kind of fell on the explanation of resistance and felt as though those leaders were they're just resistant to change and they don't want to change. And remember when we had the conversation with the leaders? I do. They, they didn't say we don't want to change, right? It was, it was the beliefs and it was, well, there's some things that need to be, we need to build some trust. We need to fix some things. So again, excellent example of how um, paying attention to those underlying cultural things can help uncover those roadblocks that actually are not there because people don't want to change, but those underlying beliefs. That came down to a simple conversational change in the way the change team was approaching the leaders in the offices. Yes. They went in telling them what to do rather than asking them questions about what they would like to do and how can we successfully take over this customer service function mm -hmm. to your satisfaction. Absolutely. And that gets to another point, which is around assumptions, right? So there was a lot of assumptions made that it was like, well, they're just resistant because that's, that's a really easy um, kind of thing to, to uh, blame, right? It's resistance. People don't want to change. They don't like change. So they're just being resistant. Well, it was undefined resistance. It was not understood. It was labeled Correct. as resistance. And in fact, they were resisting, but they were resisting for a very good reason. Yes. Yes. So you're right. So the resistance um, they assumed was coming from unwillingness to change when in fact there was a different reason. Mm -hmm. So if they had taken action to mitigate their assumption, which is that people didn't want to change, they'd have actually missed the real underlying cultural issue and consequently would not have been successful. So great example. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. The final roadblock to talk about is leadership. So research shows that leadership is the number one reason for success or failure in change. And this is a definition that comes from John Cotter that I quoted earlier and I absolutely love. And it says that leadership defines what the future should look like. So that's about casting vision. Then it aligns people with that vision. So that's about does everybody understand what the vision is? What does success look like? Where is it that we're going? And what does that new future look like? And then the last piece, which is equally important, is inspiring them to make it happen despite the obstacles. And I love this definition because all three elements are absolutely essential. Um, just because you've gotten a really clear vision and people understand it, if they don't have that inspiration that the vision is bigger than the obstacles and problems they're going to encounter, then change can fail. And so leaders have responsibility throughout a change to do these elements, kind of keeping people focused on that bigger future, keeping them aligned and then inspiring them. So again, leadership is an action, not a title. And when leaders don't act in ways that enable good change, it fails. So this is the research that I was saying that shows sponsorship, which is the change management word for great change leadership, is one of the most critical elements of project success. So every two years, ProSci does a survey about change management. And you can access that. Um, they've got that available on their website um, at changemanagement.com. And one of the questions they've consistently asked over the years is about the factors essential to change success. As you can see here, change leadership, 
again, I said it's otherwise known as sponsorship, has been the top reason for change success in every single study. So if leadership is about action, the three critical actions of change leadership are participation, communication, and building a coalition. So I want to tackle communication first. In your experience, what is the most widely used channel of communication? Scott, what would you say if somebody said, what is the most widely used channel? What do people do the most? Email. Yep. So we've got Sherry and Bruce in agreement with you. When I talk to leaders, they often think that emails and town halls are the best means of communication. For me, the message in a bottle is how I think of these forms of communication. Messages get tossed out and leaders hope they're found, opened, and understood. We believe in complete communication, where there's a feedback loop to ensure that the message was heard and that it had the intended impact. In our past webinars, we've talked about some of the ways that communication, feedback, and learning loops can get integrated into change projects. If you're interested in learning more, please email us and let us know what information we can share that will increase your ability or understanding to be effective at communication. But we just wanted to mention that here because it's such an important part of change leadership is complete communication, understanding all dimensions and elements of communication. Now, many people quote the statistic about how many times you have to repeat something in order for it to be remembered. So Scott, do you remember this? Seven times. Yes. People say five to seven times. You have to repeat over and over and over. So a few years ago, um, we were at a conference and heard a presentation that completely busted that myth of repetition. So the research that was conducted showed that no matter how many times you repeat something, if the leader or the sender of the message is not trusted, then the message will not be received. So you can repeat it seven times, a hundred times. It doesn't matter how often you repeat it if there's no trust. So our encouragement to you is before you worry about how many times you want to repeat something, assess the trust. So we've used a terrific tool created by Dr. Paul Zak called NeuroView that measures trust and provides specific actions for improving it. Another resource we'd like to recommend is this fantastic TED Talk. It breaks down the key components of trust and talks about this Harvard Business School professor's journey in helping Uber rebuild trust. And as she walks through the story, she gives us a triangle that shows authenticity, logic, and empathy are the three critical components of trust. So we highly encourage you to take a, take a look at this video. It's not that long, and it's outstanding. And anytime you're working with a leader, one of the first things you want to do is talk with them about trust and determine where they're at in terms of the people that are being asked to change. Do they need to shore up that trust? And if so, perhaps you can use some of the insights from this video around the authenticity, creating greater levels of authenticity or shoring up logic or perhaps empathy. And I'm sure you all can can guess that empathy is probably one of the most challenging areas um, in representing and, and behaving in, but absolutely essential to building trust. So for those of you listening out there, um, type in the chat box, how many times do you think you need to repeat a message? If these el three elements of trust are present, just assume that you have a highly trusted leader in an organization that is going to communicate a message to people. How many times do you think he needs to say it? Mm. Exactly correct. Sherry and Bruce, who are right on the keyboard each time, are correct. Mm -hmm. One time. And Christy, great job. Now, yeah. that's absolutely true. However, I would say that in this world of distraction and overwhelm, that messages can sometimes fade. So the value of repetition is not because the message isn't heard, but sometimes it just helps to reinforce. 
Yes, reinforcement. Make sure you don't, we have a lot of leaders who slightly change up the message each time yes. because they want to feel like it's got to be like fresh and new. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Th that's a great point, Scott. In fact, last week I was, um, I was with a leadership team and we were doing a strategy refresh kind of facilitated conversation and it was absolutely amazing. The leader had communicated strategy over and over and over and believed that he was extremely clear and everybody understood it. On the flip side, the people participating in this session were um, extremely frustrated because they thought that no strategy existed in the organization. So it was an absolutely fascinating um, kind of study and communication, if you will. Now, I wouldn't say trust was the issue there, but repetition wise, I'm getting to the point where some leaders feel or they remember saying something over and over and over as this CEO had. However, there were individuals in that room who were new to the organization and they had never had the opportunity to listen to the CEO share the strategy and walk through the details and connect the points of the strategy to the objectives and to their goals. And so it was an incredible aha, not just brainstorming strategy for the future, but for the first time they put the dots together and were like, wow, now I understand. So the, the caution for the leaders is that the group you may have presented and shared your message with can be changing. So that's why the repetition is very important. Excellent. So trust and repetition, important in communication and complete communication as well. So we wanted to share this very important quote connected to communication. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that will go to his heart. That's a great quote from Nelson yes. Mandela. And I love this because, again, this gets to one of the key components of communication is talking to people in their language, not your language. And using words they understand, not using words that you understand. So super important for effective communication. All right, so we're talking here about overcoming the roadblocks that you might encounter in successful change. So we talked about the roadblocks as capacity, capability, culture, and leadership. And you'll see here four specific ways of overcoming those roadblocks. In capacity, you want to make sure you're assessing it, paying attention to where is your organization at, and then once you have an understanding, you can either reduce the change, you can reorganize it, or you can eliminate some change. And Scott, we had an experience where we went in and we actually heat mapped all the changes going on in, in an organization so that they could better understand their capacity. And we discovered something really interesting. Yes, we've talked about this in a previous webinar, and the message is that leaders are not completely aware of all the changes going on in their organization. We were able to pinpoint a critical go live date in the change that was going to occur at a time when the organization it was happening to was completely unable to handle the change because of all the change that was going on at that moment during that two week period in that part of the organization. And when we showed our heat map report to the person leading that, and she's like, I don't need to see that. I know what changes are going on in our organization. And I showed it to her and she goes, what does this mean? We dug through the data and she started going through, yeah, I know that change. I know that change. And then she'd say, well, what's that change? I don't know. I never authorized that. Whose change is that? But what's happening in organization and happens a lot of times is you may have leaders in other parts of the organization that are making changes that unaware to them, they're impacting people in other parts of the organization. So it's important for a leader to take the time to thoroughly look at changes in an organization. Now this takes some time and some effort, but depending upon how critical that change is to your organization, you might wanna consider um, your level of thoroughness in looking at this. For this particular situation we were in, it was absolutely critical that they got it right. 
And it was absolutely critical that the people that had to do the change were able to do it flawlessly. So it became very, very important. And thanks, Scott. That's an awesome example of how just understanding the capacity enables a leader to make smart choices versus getting blindsided. And that's really what we're talking about here. We're not suggesting that you, um, you know, eliminate every change that is super important to the organization. But if you want to be successful and you overwhelm the capacity of an organization, it, the reality is that success will be limited for any of the changes. Yes, with that information, the leadership team was able to make decisions to restage some of the uh, less important changes. So this mm -hmm. critical change could go through smoothly. Exactly. So capacity is one roadblock. Another one is capability. And the remedy for overcoming that is building it. So first you need to determine what's missing and then really create a plan for building capability. Um, so that, that's roadblock number two. Roadblock number three is culture. So our recommendation there is measure it. Make sure you have qualitative and quantitative data that helps you understand where your change will be helped or hindered and then apply culturally intelligent change. And again, we've got a resource, an ebook, and a checklist if that would be helpful for you. Um, please download that and, um, and utilize that to overcome that culture roadblock. So finally, leadership, or I should say lack of leadership, um, is a potential roadblock to successful change. So our recommendation here is coaching and sharing the Change Leader Toolkit. The Change Leader Toolkit is a way that you can overcome the overwhelm of managing multiple changes and remembering to take appropriate action in leading through change. So just quickly, um, if you remember that sponsorship or change leadership is the most essential element of change success, and there's three primary behaviors, participating in the change, communication, building a coalition, all important, sounds simple, but what do each of those things mean? Well, these are all the actions that fall into participating, and I'm sure each one of you, your expertise can add to this list. We could probably come up with a hundred different behaviors to indicate how a leader would participate in leading change. Here's a list around communication, setting context for change, clearly and consistently articulating why the change is happening, what created the need for the change, building trust. So these are all actions that need to be taken. And finally, building a coalition. Here are some examples of, again, specific actions leaders need to take in communicating change. So imagine the number of changes that a leader is expected to successfully be sponsoring. How do you remember what to do and when to do it for every single change you're responsible for? So it's interesting because Scott and I were working with the leadership team and I remember meeting um, with a senior VP and he was really phenomenally sponsoring one change. And then we were talking about another one that he also had responsibility for. And it was fascinating as we were going through the coaching call because he recognized, oh yeah, all these actions, the things I'm doing around participating and communicating and building a coalition. I'm doing a great job in this change, but sadly lacking in this other change. So what we recognize is a lot of leaders are juggling lots of different change, and that's just the changes they're responsible for, let alone all the other work um, that's on their plates. So to address the specific question, we created the Change Leader Toolkit. And this toolkit is for leaders and change agents that support them. It's intended to be used to manage the actions for multiple changes and ensure that some specific action is taken each day. So it's really our way of breaking things down. In the Change Leader Toolkit, there's three super simple steps. The first is inventorying all the changes. So like Scott was sharing before about capacity. Just having a list is incredibly useful to a leader. And in the list, it's really important that they're not only looking at the changes they initiate, but all the changes impacting their team from across the organization. 
And I have to say, this is one of the very surprising steps for many leaders. You know, they know the ones that they've initiated, but for the other ones, they don't realize the impact that it's having on their people. And that's the next step is um, we provide two worksheets there. So again, the first inventory all changes. There's a worksheet that helps um, accomplish that. Then determining the impact. So, all right, I understand these are all the changes. Is it a significant impact, minimal impact? So there's a tool there that helps understand each change. <clears throat> the last and most important part is the weekly actions. So the key to success is the weekly actions. And as a leader specifies exactly what he or she will do every week, they're able to main, maintain focus on the changes they're responsible for, and they'll increase the success of each change because they're taking action. So the, the webinar that we're doing today is not enough time to go through each of these elements. We've actually created a video and that's available along with the tool set. Um, so feel free to take a look at that, download the tool set. Um, we've made the toolkit available not only in um, a document form, but for those of you who are OneNote fans, it's also available in OneNote so that you can replicate those and use those with your leaders or if you're a leader yourself, um, leverage it and utilize it. The part I like to point out with this, Donna, and you touched on it a little bit, is that um, when you look at this, it looks like there's a lot of stuff for a leader to do that on a time. Mm -hmm. um, someone, as you mentioned out, can help them prepare that information. But at the very least, that last weekly planner sheet, if the, if the leader already knows what changes, three changes are important to him, and he knows what he specifically wants to focus on this week, this is a tool when they sit down to do their weekly planning to specifically on each day say, what am I going to spend 10 minutes doing to support these top three changes that are important to me? and it will help them focus that, that effort. So um, just want to put that out there that you go right to that last sheet if you think you know what you want to focus on, but don't mm -hmm. overlook the other things for the reasons that Donna mentioned, because yeah. identifying all those changes, we, in our experience, is usually an eye-opening experience for leaders. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thanks, Scott. So the toolkit itself answers three questions. The first is, well, you need to know all the changes you're responsible for supporting. Some of the changes, again, the leader themselves may have initiated and some may have come from other departments or functions in the organization. So the first step is capturing what changes are going on. Second, you need to know what success looks like for each change. Um, sometimes leaders are really surprised at the, um, br the, br the breadth of a change. You know, they think it's very narrow. And once they better understand what success looks like, it just shifts their understanding. So as Scott mentioned, the first two worksheets get completed and then they're just maintained. So that, that work, once that work is done, they're just references for that weekly change planner. And that is really the power of this system is that weekly planner. And that answers the question of what's something I can do every single day as a leader to ensure change success. So our recommendation is that a leader utilizes this every week, taking a look at the changes, that whole list of changes, then selecting a specific change and applying an action they'll take to support that change. And our recommendation is a 10-minute action once each day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you might focus on the same change because you're going live or there's something very significant happening, or you might rotate between all the different changes you're responsible for sponsoring. But the key here is that you're deciding where you focus your time and attention. The change planner ensures that you're taking meaningful action as an effective change leader. So the change leader toolkit is a simple, structured means of enabling successful change. So it's available for all of you to download. So we've, we've gotten an incredibly positive response. And our goal in putting this out there is there's so many different change management approaches and change management tools, but there's not a whole lot that we've seen that um, facilitate or enable great change leadership. Lots of books on it, lots of great theories on it, but we wanted a practical, specific way of helping leaders be successful.
So I wanted to move into questions. Are there any questions that the audience has either about the toolkit or some of the roadblocks or even suggestions and ideas that you have? And while you're thinking about questions, I'm going to move into the next slide. But if you do have a question, please feel free to post that. Um, so what we wanted to bring your attention to, we love resources, as you can tell from what we've shared in our presentation, um, the TED Talk, we write a weekly tip where we're always sharing the greatest books that we're reading and the new ideas we're coming across. So on the website, um, anything that, that you see here and a whole lot more is available. Um, we've got recommended reading around your brain and neuroscience, around change, culture, leadership. You can see our paper on culturally intelligent change is available for download, the Change Leader Toolkit, information on great meetings, um, Smart Start. So um, we just encourage you to check out our resource page. This is here because um, we believe that the more information, good information that's shared, the more successful you are, and the more we collectively make change work, the better the world will be. Excellent. So when it comes to success, almost every successful person begins with two fundamental beliefs that help them achieve that success. One, they believe the future can be better than the present. And two, they firmly believe that they have the power to make it so. We encourage you as you move forward in making your change to believe that you have the power to make it so and that these tools and this information that we've shared will be helpful to you in achieving that. Thanks, Scott. So again, if you have questions, please do type those into the Q&A panel. And we have one from Gail, where she asks, do you have any tips on reducing, reorganizing, and eliminating change? So um, I'll share some thoughts. And then Scott, if you have anything you wanted to add. Um, the first thing is really making sure that you know what all the changes are because you can't, you can't prioritize and decide between them if you're not clear on, on everything that's going on. Um, the next thing is bringing that to the attention of leaders because you, you want to make sure that they're, they have kind of a line of sight into the change. And it's not just about timing and go live, but it's also about the significance of impact on various people groups. So Scott gave the, the example of that one organization um, where they had so many changes going on. There was another, it was a financial institution I was working with years ago. And we went and looked at all the changes going on. And in their customer service group at this particular financial institution, they were going to have to be in more training in a week then there were hours in a week. And that was just training for all the changes, let alone, um, you know, getting their work done. So um, the question, you know, in terms of how to reorganize and reprioritize, as a change agent, you can make recommendations, but it's really um, up to the leader bringing it to their attention. And that's why we wanted to share those four roadblocks with you. Because if you can help leaders understand that, that capacity is a real um, as a resource, and if it's there's less capacity and more change, then that's a problem. And helping them think through how to rebalance it. So, like Scott said, um, for the one organization, we just help them kind of shift around some of the dates when things were going to happen, and it it gave the leaders a macro view versus in many many situations change happens and it's kind of change by change by change and each project team is focused on making their change successful versus understanding the collective impact. Yes, I uh, completely agree with that. This comes down to leadership being aware and making uh, decisions about what changes are the most important to them, but they're mm -hmm. not going to make those decisions until they have complete awareness and do not assume that they do. If you'd like to um, be happy to share the criteria that we look at when it comes to assessing impact on people, if you email, email me after the, um, the webinar at Change at Brighton Leadership Group, and just remind me and I'll be happy to share that criteria with you. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because sometimes leaders are like, oh, what are you telling me? I have to stop, you know, doing this change. And like, well, no, you don't have to stop it, but you need to, you need to be smart about when the change is going to hit people. Because remember, while a project team may focus on a go live, 
as a change team, you need to pay attention to the ongoing implementation, right? Like how, how does a change get sustained and remain successful? And if they're really, really focused on getting a return on that change, um, I think they'll be more receptive. So it's kind of the strategies about how to have the right conversation with the leader, as Scott said, with the right data, and then showing them the options. Again, because you're not saying just stop the change. It's how do we organize this portfolio of change so that we're taking advantage of capacity? All right, Christy asked, if the change needs to happen immediately, but trust is an issue, can that trust be built while you're attempting the change? So I would say, yes, you can build trust because trust can happen from, you know, um, telling people what you're going to do and then following through on it. Um, tips for building trust quickly. I mean, it's in some ways, it's somewhat old fashioned about um, giving your word, keeping your word. Um, then um, the, the TED talk that we shared with you, I thought there was some amazing insight around being authentic, which is one of those words people throw around a lot, right? Like, oh, show up and be your authentic self. Um, but this, the TED speaker presents some really helpful information that clarifies what authenticity looks like. And I think that's often missing um, when leaders are speaking, right? They're not, they're not speaking from a true and authentic place. And so helping them understand what that means, it's not, you know, breaking down into tears and, and so on. It's just, it's gen genuinely being themselves. So helping them understand. And then building trust quickly, I guess, Christy, I'd have to understand, um, was there a breakdown in trust? You know what I mean? So you're repairing it or are you simply trying to build it like a new leader has come into place? And I would say there's different answers depending upon um, kind of which scenario that is. So I would recommend an amazing resource um, from Dennis and Michelle Reyna. It's called Trust and Betrayal in the Workplace. And I love this book because not only does it give some of the key components of trust and trust building, but it also addresses those workplaces where leaders have eroded trust. And it has some specific strategies. So depending upon what your scenario is in terms of building trust while you're implementing change, um, check out their book and they'll, they'll give you some insights into how, how you can kind of have a parallel track in both implementing change as well as building trust. So there was a question over here that she asked if there's any suggestions on how to identify what are the current beliefs that are um, preventing changes. Mm. There's two ways to do that. And I would encourage you to look at our resource on culturally intelligent change because um, we talk about that. One of them would be to do interview. You could do an assessment either qualitatively or quantitatively or both. So um, you could try focus groups. Um, you can try some sort of uh, culture tool, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. But you need to have some um, skills in running a focus group to be able to um, make that uh, a place where you're going to get open and honest answers. Yeah. And so building on that, Scott, you're absolutely right. Um, obviously, the ideal is actually measuring culture and having some clarity, but simply in having conversation. And I think this is part of the art and science of change where um, the art part is ha having the conversation and asking enough questions and listening deeply so that you're really hearing what's going on, but listening without judgment or assumption. Because that's the challenge that a lot of times we bring into it. Like I was giving the example of the change team who was assuming resistance just came from um, people not wanting to change. So it's really easy to make that assumption versus saying, well, let me really, let me pay attention to what's going on. So I would suggest just a simple conversation, bringing no assumptions and really a desire to understand can help get at some of those deeper, deeper things. Sherry asked a question around thoughts on how to say no. How do you successfully communicate with others that we can't do everything, especially at a time when there's a lot of change going on? So Sherry, this is a fantastic question because I think no is often one of the most underutilized words um, when it comes to change. And it ties into something I think is really profound, which is 
the idea, I don't know if any of you have heard this concept, but I think it was maybe 20 so or so years ago, priority was a singular word. And somehow over the last few decades, it's morphed into a plural word, which is totally ridiculous because if you think of what is a priority, it's like a singular most important thing. But we've we've completely butchered that term and we've made it plural so that now we've got multiple things that are most important. And then you compound that with um, the amount of distraction and the amount of, you know, noise in the system and it gets really confusing and really complicated. So in terms of thoughts on how to say no, um, I think it, it comes to appealing to a, a kind of a, a leader's higher interest in what success looks like. So if a leader's just about like, well, let's get all these changes done. That's a really different um, definition of success than, you know, I want this change done so that these things happen and really focusing on the return or the realization that you anticipate happening from that change, and then providing the data. And again, every leader is different in terms of how they make decisions and um, what matters most to them. But the key thing in um, helping leaders say no is um, possibly sharing some of these roadblocks with them. And it's interesting, as I've spoken with leaders and shared with them things around capacity, um, they've really had a light bulb, <laughs> um, like, wow, I had no idea. And in one leadership team, um, we, did, we did just kind of around, around the room where each leader, each senior leader in the leadership team sort of evaluated where they thought their teams were as far as um, we called it change saturation and, um, and just kind of did a, a quick uh, score check there. And then we did um, a quick little survey out to the organization to see where they were at. So just by providing some data and helping leaders understand the consequences of moving forward with change when there's no capacity can help them say no or potentially reprioritize. So we have another question from David. Every, so I'll just read it so that everybody has the context. Um, he says, we have a project that's fully integrated with the organization. It impacts virtually every department and function of an $11 billion company. It's being implemented in five phases, and the first two phases have taken longer than expected to implement and adopt to the point of meeting expectations. Because the project is behind, the plan is now ramped up for next implementations. How would you get confidence in the organization to execute the next implementations with a feeling it will succeed even though the first two have not? Wow, excellent been, question, David. And I'm sure virtually everybody on the phone call can sympathize um, with scenarios in their workplace. Um, maybe not quite as large of a change, but definitely changes that did not occur the way they were supposed to. And then, you know, leadership is just moving forward. Um, so this is a great example of where um, trust can start getting eroded. And I'm not sure what the causes of the delays were, but um, when trust is eroded, then the project will start going even more slowly. And I'm sure you can probably relate to that. So um, in terms of getting confidence in the organization to execute the next implementations, um, I'd probably, I'd, do, I'd want to do something I call change triage, which is where you sort of go in and analyze what's going on, where has it fallen short, um, you know, back to some of the project management um, triple constraints. So if you're thinking about um, cost, quality, and time, you can't compress a time frame or reduce the amount of money invested in a project and deliver the same amount of scope or quality. And it's fascinating to me how many people miss that very simple but very profound insight that all three of those elements are connected. And so changing any one of them will change the others. So perhaps um, in that project, one of those, you know, like they've there because right now they're reducing the amount of time. So I hope that company is willing to invest more money or change the scope because otherwise they're doomed uh, for repeating the failure in implementation. And the other challenge um, that you're that you're raising here back to kind of capability is 
Um, and this ties to neuroscience. People want to be successful. So if there's a feeling in the organization like, oh my goodness, we tried this change and it didn't work, um, you're already kind of, I'm going to say, behind the eight ball um, because that's sort of the belief and assumption that, that people have going into the next phases. And the question is, um, I would say for this next phase, can you turn that around and start demonstrating some small wins? So even though the first two phases didn't roll out in a timely fashion, how can the team orchestrate the next phase so that you're showing the organization, you know, we've made some changes and start creating success because um, success builds on success. And um, if you're able to kind of reorient the team in that direction, it'll help with morale and it will rebuild trust. So I think that that could be a way that um, you could shift the feeling that you are going to be successful if you just demonstrate small wins along the way. Anything you want to add to that, Scott? No, I think you've answered that beautifully. Awesome. Um, it's going to be a tough challenge, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to require understanding what was a, for leadership to understand what went wrong the first time. Why didn't it? Yeah. And being honest with themselves, if they think they're going to be successful by compressing the time frame because they're behind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So fantastic questions. I think you guys are all amazing. And I really appreciate your participation in our conversation today. Um, I, again, encourage you to check out the resource page. They're all there because we want to share. And if you've got some fabulous tools and resources and cool things you've come across, please share them with us. Um, in the meantime, have a magnificent rest of your day, and we look forward to you joining us on an upcoming call. So thanks, everybody, and have a spectacular day.